So welcome to this Facebook Live on the topic ME-CFS fibromyalgia, long COVID and creating your own roadmap. Question that people with these conditions often ask is, where do I start? What should I focus on? And it's easy to get a bit overwhelmed with all of that because there's so much information out there. And so in this training, I'm going to focus on why you need a roadmap and the nine areas that I think it's useful to focus on if you have those conditions. And by the end, you'll be able to do an audit so you can identify what areas to work on and you can use the WHOOP strategy, W-O-O-P, that I will share. So do just pop a message in the chat. Let me know you can see me, hear me. Appreciate your interaction. If you comment, give me a like, it does help other people see this video. Maybe I just needed more attention when I was a kid. Um, if you're watching the replay, put hashtag replay. And if you've got any questions, pop them in the chat as we go. In the last session, I talked about part one of solving the MECS puzzle. And we focused on the importance of an integrated approach. And I will talk about those blue areas in later videos, heredity, environment, medical interventions, lifestyle resources. And I did talk in that last session about the three types of stress. There's acute physical stress, chronic physical stress, and psychological and social stress. Now I have made a video where I talk about how those types of stress impact our energy, our thinking, our digestion, our sleep, and our immunity. And certainly when I learned and understood how stress can affect those functions, it was like a light bulb moment for me. And I've had many clients who've said the same thing when they've watched that video. And in the video where I go into that in more detail, the reason why people with ME-CFS, fibromyalgia and even long COVID aren't getting their health and energy back. I focus on three things. The first thing is I talk about what research says about what switches our energy off, what switches our energy back on. The second thing I focus on, those nine areas. Now we're gonna have an overview of that today, but in that video, I do a deep dive so you can really start to understand what areas that I think are important for people with these conditions to focus on based on my 16 years of working with people with those conditions and my own eight years of having those conditions. And I want to just focus on why it's important to have a roadmap. Here's the thing, if we focus on one thing at a time, then we can take steps in a manageable way. One of the mistakes people make is that they try and do too many things and then they feel overwhelmed, then they feel discouraged and sometimes give up. But if you get this right, then you've got a sense of clarity about what to focus on and we'll start that process today. And then it's easier to get some momentum because you are focusing on one thing and then you can move on to the next area when you're ready. And the third thing I talk about in that video is the Building Resilience Group program that's starting soon. This is a 12 week program. So if you wanna just watch the first two parts of the video and take some action, that's great. I'll be happy to have helped you. But if you wanna check out the training that I'm gonna be starting soon and decide if it's for you, then you're welcome to do that. And if you decide you do wanna chat further, there's a link at the end of the video. So as I said, today we're gonna to focus on those nine areas that I think are important to focus on. So the first three areas are focusing on mindset. As I've mentioned, there are three types of stress. If you've got an acute physical issue or a chronic physical issue, it makes sense to go and speak to your doctor. In my experience, doctors don't give us much insights into how psychological stress may be affecting our health and our recovery if we have health conditions. Researchers tell us that the mind can activate the stress response and puts the body in a state of fight or flight and that can hinder recovery. What's interesting to me is that not everyone embraces this idea and understands how it is impacting on our health. 
But my experience is that if psychological stress is a factor and people generally have an idea, actually that's not quite true. Sometimes people do have an insight into how much psychological stress is affecting them. But sometimes when I talk to people, initially they're not aware and it's only by doing some audits with them, they start to become clear and the kind of penny drops. But there is a professor from Stanford University. You may have heard me talk about him before. His name's Robert Sapolsky. And in the video I just mentioned, I talk about his work. He talks about the role of psychological stress and how it can impact our health and make it more likely that we get diseases that make us sick. One of the examples he talks about is that people can sit at a table moving small pieces of wood and they can be generating the same amount of stress as athletes running the 100 metres. Any guesses what those people sitting at the table moving those small pieces of wood are doing? Pop your answer in the chat. What do you reckon? I'll, I'll leave that hanging and let's see if we get some answers to that. Okay, you may have had your own experience of the mind affecting the body. If you've learned to drive, most people experience nerves. So Penny says worrying, they are worrying, but what are they doing with those pieces of wood? What's the significance of the pieces of wood? Um, so, yeah, you've probably had your own experience of, of the mind affecting the body. You know, I remember when I was learning to drive my first lesson, I was nervous and needed to go to the loo. That was an example of the mind affecting the body. If you've ever had the experience of someone saying something and you blush, again, that's a, an example of the mind affecting the body. Now, if, you're, if you are watching this and you sort of think, oh, actually, I actually don't believe in that work of Professor Robert Sapolsky, refute it. Let me know your thoughts. I'd be very interested to hear. But, you know, he's a professor of neurology and biology. So I kind of accept what he's talking about. And it is research based. So if you do recognise that psychological stress is hindering your recovery, keep watching. I recognise that it did contribute to me getting sick and it contributed to me staying sick. I was a worrier before I got sick. And so when I was sick, I was still a warrior. And addressing the stress was a key part of my recovery, okay? And everyone I work with recognizes that psychological stress is an issue. So Penny says, I agree, mind does affect the body. Yeah, absolutely. So question I get people to consider is, where are you on this spectrum? So on, the right, we've got rest and digest. That's when the body is in healing state. And on the extreme left, we've got extreme fight, flight, freeze. When we're in that state, it has certain effects on the body. As I say, I talk about those in more detail in that video I mentioned. If you want that video, I'll tell you how you can get it at the end. But when we're in fight, flight, freeze, then it's harder for the body to heal. So if you were to rate yourself one to five, with one being extreme fight flight, five being in rest and digest, what number on average would you guess that you are? When I had MECFS, I was definitely in the four, five region a lot of the time. Okay. So Let's talk about these nine areas. The first thing we need to do is to identify the psychological stresses. So Doris says four. Uh, yeah, and that's kind of where I was. So it's important to identify the unhelpful responses we're generating. Now, there might be some of those things that you're aware of, a bit like the iceberg, the stuff above the water. For instance, I was very aware that I was generating anxiety but I didn't really know how to stop it. But what I realized when I started learning brain training techniques is that there was a lot of stuff going on below the surface of the water unconsciously. And 
when I learned strategies to help me identify the unconscious patterns, I was able to do the next thing, which is interrupting those unhelpful responses. But actually, before we move on to that, let's just get you to rate yourself. So if you would score how good you are at identifying the unhelpful responses, would you say that you're currently red? I'm really not good at this. I really need to learn how to do that so that I can actually shift the patterns. Would you say you're orange or would you know I'm OK, but I could do better or I'm green. I've completely nailed this. Don't need help in that area. So if you like, you can just draw this on pen and paper if you've got the PDF, you know, and you can draw on it on your computer. Do so. But just rate yourself. Otherwise, just use pen and paper. Just draw, do a quick drawing or you can pop it in the chat as Penny's just done. Penny says she's orange. So, yeah, I would say when I had MECFS, I was definitely red. Doris is saying orange to red. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that. So the next thing we need to do is we need to interrupt those unhelpful responses. OK, and there are a number of ways of doing that. But again, just rate yourself. How good do you think you are? at interrupting those responses. Are you red, orange, or green? Red, I'm not good at this, I really need to work on it. Orange, I'm okay, but I could do better. Green, what would you say? I'm gonna say I was also a red at that, okay? So just rate yourself and pop your response in the chat if you like. And then the next stage is to create new responses. And with practice, these new responses can become our default. So when I started learning these techniques, I did realize, oh my goodness, I'm pretty neurotic. I'm generating a lot of unhelpful responses. And I, again, if I was to rate myself red, orange, green for creating new responses, I would say, if I was being really generous, I might say I'm an orange, but I suspect I was close to a red, maybe I was a combination of red and orange. So what would you say? How good are you at creating the new responses? You know, so example of that, if I overdo did it and relapsed, had a dip, then I'd be chastising myself. Okay, so I wasn't very good at creating a new response to being in a dip. With once I started learning brain training techniques, I started getting better at that. I was able to cultivate a new response, which is just cultivating calm, acceptance and trust. That helped me actually come out of the dip more quickly. So Doris saying red and then red again. OK, so, yeah, just rate yourself. So now you can start to see just by looking at my chart that there's a bit of a picture developing. So next one, movement. How good are you at approaching movement? in a sustainable way. Would you say, you know, you're good at approaching, managing your energy sustainably, or do you tend to boom and bust and then have to rest until your energy gets good again? And then when you get energy, you overdo it and you have a dip again. So that was my constant pattern to begin with when I had MEC. So I'm going to say I was a red. I wasn't very good at approaching movement in a sustainable way. OK, what would you say? Red, orange, green. Tendency to boom, bust, working on this, says Penny. Great. OK, so just again, give yourself a colour, red, orange, green. Feel free to pop it in the chat if you've just joined us. Next area, nutrition. You know, without going to, I will go into more detail in all these areas over the coming weeks, but with nutrition, how would you rate yourself currently? Would you say your nutrition is red? I really need to work on this. Orange, I'm okay, but I could do better. Or green. Now, this is one area where I would say I was green because I was always interested in nutrition. And when I developed MECFS, I did go and see a doctor trained in nutritional medicine. He gave me some suggestions and I actually didn't find it too difficult to follow his suggestions, which involved 
giving up sugar and processed carbohydrates, processed foods. Um, so Doris is nutrition, Penny saying green, amazing. Doris, green as well, amazing. So that's great that you've got that area nailed. So you know you don't have to really focus on that area too much at the moment, okay? And then the next area is sleep. What would you say your approach to sleep is now? I appreciate that having MECFS, fibromyalgia, long COVID can interrupt your sleep, you know, because my digestion wasn't working very well. Uh, it meant that I was hungry quite a lot of time and sometimes I was waking up in the night hungry and I had to get up and eat quite a lot of food um, because my digestion just wasn't working very well. So I would say at best, if I was being generous, my sl approach to sleep was probably orange. I was okay. I was quite good at having routines around sleep. And when I first had MECFS, I didn't even have a laptop or smartphone, so I didn't have those distractions. What would you say you are for sleep? Maybe put an S and the color so I know which one you're talking about. Sleep's great, but my approach is orange. Okay, so great, it's not red, but you know there are things that you can improve. Okay, so I'll keep moving on. So the next piece is if we want a full life, we need to have a healthy relationship to ourselves. So this is about being compassionate towards ourselves, being able to set good boundaries for ourselves. That might mean boundaries around activity and pausing, as we just mentioned in relation to boom and bust. So again, rate yourself. What would you say? Are you red, orange or green in that area? I would say maybe being generous. Actually, I'll, I'm gonna say that I was maybe a little bit red, a little bit orange, but I definitely hadn't nailed that area. Okay, so what about you? Doris is saying red. Okay, um, so at least you know where you are. That's a good starting point. Then the next area is relationship to others. So this is about having healthy relationships with others, being able to set good, healthy boundaries. You know, if you are a people pleaser or have that tendency to do people pleasing behaviors, then maybe the boundaries aren't as good as they need to be. I was definitely a bit of a people pleaser when I had MECFS. So again, rate yourself. Are you red, orange, green in that area? I would say I was probably an orange. There were some things I was quite good at. I knew a few people who weren't very good around timekeeping. And so if we arranged to meet up and they were late, I would just leave when I said I was going to leave. OK, but in certainly in other areas, I needed to work on that. And finally, the ninth area. So Penny says orange for the last two. Thanks for your input. Um, final area, and Doris says orange as well, is kind of our relationship to the outside world. And what I mean by that, that's about the degree to which you're living your life and designing your life on your terms. And an example I give of that is the difference between someone who wakes up in the morning and the first thing they do is turn on their smartphone, that used to be me, and spend half an hour or longer scrolling on Facebook, looking at pictures of cats and funny things. And the person who gets up in the morning, makes a drink, does some exercise. And I used to be the person who turned on my phone and looked at it before I did anything else. And now I'm much more of the time, most of the time, get up, make a drink, do some exercise. So I'm kind of setting my agenda. In fact, I even before I get up, I spend 10 minutes doing some meditation. Um, so Penny says could be better. Joe's saying that's me on the phone, I mean. Uh, and Doris is saying me too. Yeah, you know, it's very common. Um, Brendan Burchard, who's supposed to be the number one coach, that's something he talks about. He says, you know, if you, if you are turning on your phone or your computer first thing, you're letting other people set your agenda, okay? Because I know 
I've, I've sort of weaned myself off it, but I have been in the last few months or whatever, spending more time on Twitter during the day, um, getting caught up in conversations and drama and the, the conversations can be a little bit um, fraught. Some people are being quite aggressive because it's talking about the current viral situation and people have very strong opinions and if you share an opinion that's different then you know you get strong reactions and I've actually just got to the point saying well actually you know in fact my friend says this you know there's no point getting into conversations with these people you're not going to change anyone's mind and actually it's just using up your energy so I've got to the point now where I'm I was getting quite hooked into that okay so now I'm just saying actually I'd rather do other things with those moments you know if I add all that time up let's say it's an hour a day I could spend an hour doing something else okay like reading a book I actually was on a call yesterday part of a coaching group I'm in and that's one of the things we talked about if you had an extra hour an extra two hours what would you be spending that time doing and one of the things I identified is that I want to spend more time just reading a book rather than looking at a screen because I haven't been reading that much. So Doris says, but when you are very fatigued, it's easier to watch YouTube than do exercise. I appreciate that. What I would say, and this is something that Dr. Sarah Myhill says, is that when we are really fatigued, then actually looking at a screen can use up quite a lot of energy. And there were times when I had MECFS that I couldn't even look at a telly because it used up too much energy. And what I would say to you is this, Doris, and I'm saying this with love, um, but what would be easier or even more beneficial to watch something on YouTube or to listen to a guided relaxation if you're feeling fatigued? So that's just food for thought. That's not to say you don't do those things. You might want a bit of fun time, but it's just something to consider if you are really fatigued and there were times even during recovery that I recognized actually it wasn't useful for me to look at a screen because it kind of depleted my energy and stimulated me rather than recharged me and actually I'm going to make a short video on that topic because um, there's some quite interesting stuff around that okay Doris says you're right well that's just as I said that's the thought I'm not saying don't watch YouTube ever you know, you might want some fun time, but also just consider we need to be strategic about how we use our energy. So if I think about that area, you know, when I had MECFS, I would, if I, again, if I was being generous, I might say I was orange. OK, so now if you look at that, you can start to see very clearly that there are some areas to work on. OK. Uh, you know, if I even just started with the reds, um, then that would be beneficial. The goal would be to kind of even move from red to orange. I'm starting to change that map. OK, and then you can see, OK, this is the next area I want to work on. So any questions, any comments? Actually, I'm going to need to skip through a load of slides. Let's just skip through those. So what is interesting is if we think about those nine areas, in my experience, there is synergy in making shifts in each area. So and that can impact our energy. So let me tell you what, what I'm what do I mean by that? Well, if I even the very act of identifying the unhelpful responses identifying our emotion can mean that we shift from being in that emotion okay and being kind of consumed by that emotion to actually observing the emotion and when we do that then the body starts to calm down okay so these things just making shifts in one area can affect other areas. You know, it can affect this area. We're starting to create a new response. And this could get very messy, but these things all link up. You know, if I'm 
reducing my stress levels, then I can do more movement. I'm going to be digesting my food more efficiently. My sleep's going to get better. Okay, I'm starting to have a better relationship to, with myself because if I'm tuning into what I'm feeling emotionally, then if I'm in a situation where someone says something that I have a reaction to and I feel uncomfortable, then I'm getting better at tuning into those emotions rather than suppressing them, which is something I used to do, and then experiencing tension and depletion of energy in my body. So all these things link up. I won't draw lines for all of them, but imagine just literally joining all these areas up. This is kind of how it works. As you start working on one area, it starts affecting other areas of your life. That would, I say, it's be a very messy drawing, but you, hopefully you're getting the idea that all these things start to impact on each other. Okay, so it's pretty powerful. Okay, I was actually just looking at some photos earlier that clients have sent me. This is a woman called Joanna, and this is a picture she sent me a few weeks after training, where she'd gone on a long walk. This is. Uh, Olav, this is a picture he sent me, didn't want to have a picture with him in it. So I don't show this picture much because some might say it's just a picture of some a lake and some mountains. But this was this chap, Olav, who walked for hours to take this picture. That's a stock photo. But one of my clients, Chris, who's a journalist, uh, he got in touch with me and said, I'm coming to one of your free talks just to let you know. I'm very skeptical. So I'll be asking different difficult questions. And I said to him, bring it on makes it more interesting for me and six people came to that free talk three of them signed up to do the training his goal was to run a marathon and that's something he managed to do after doing the training so got a question for you which is if you look at your little map that we've done that may look like this may be a bit different to this what is one area that you could focus on Pop it in the chat if you like, just what is one area you think actually that would be a good place for me to start. And what we're going to do is I'm going to talk about the WHOOP strategy. What is the WHOOP strategy? You may be wondering. So the WHOOP strategy is uh, something that was devised by Professor of Psychology, Gabriel Otun Jen, who's a very interesting character. And so Penny says, creating a better morning routine to use my energy efficiently. Great. So that's kind of in my diagram, you're kind of focusing on your relationship to the outside world and bringing it back to yourself. OK, movement. All right, cool. What is the WHOOP strategy? Well, the W, and actually I first shared this uh, in response to a post of Joe's. Uh, the W stands for wish. What is your wish? So identify what it is you want, okay? And think about the outcome. What would it look like, okay? Why do you want that outcome? Okay, what's the benefit? going to be. So Penny's saying create a better morning energy, a better morning routine to use my energy efficiently. Okay, so she's given an explanation. She's kind of talked about the outcome. The next thing to think about is what are the potential obstacles? Okay, so write a list. What are the things that you know from experience are potential obstacles? All right, so for instance, one might be reaching for my phone. And how many times have you thought, I'll just literally look at my phone for five minutes. And before you know it, half an hour, three quarters of an hour, an hour has gone by. So Penny's saying distraction. OK, so that's the obstacles. So the next thing to do then is to make a plan. OK, what is your plan going to be? to develop tools and strategies to deal with those obstacles to, that support your recovery, okay? Sorry, let me reset, say that again. What is the plan going to be to develop tools and strategies to deal with those obstacles 
in order to support your recovery. So last time I talked a bit about this kind of pattern that people get into with the boom and bust is that they're in a dip, they have no energy, their energy starts to build. And so what happens to their activity levels, they go from not doing very much to being active and instead of, oops, instead of stopping when their energy starts to dip, they keep going and then they use up energy that they didn't have here and that results in another dip. Okay, and then they repeat that pattern. And that doesn't help our energy. Therefore, what are your strategies going to be to deal with this tendency to keep going when you know you need to stop? If you like the slides for this session, just put the word PDF in the chat. Tag me if you're watching the replay, then I'll get a notification or do send me a message if I haven't responded and I'll send you the PDF, which is a reminder of what we've covered today. If you'd like that video that I talked about, where I talk about those three things, what's well, switching our energy on and off, those nine areas, and I talk about them in more detail, talk about how stress is impacting our energy, our digestion, our sleep, our immune system, our thinking. And I talk about the building resilience group training that I'm going to be starting soon. Then put the word video in the chat, tag me, I'll send you that video. If you've got any questions, feel free to get in touch. See if there's any final questions, pop them in now. Otherwise we'll pause and maybe just do a very quick relaxation. I did the session a bit earlier today because I've got a client in a bit. Penny says, thanks so much. Great tips, video. Okay, yeah, I will send you the video, Penny. All right, so shall we finish with a short relaxation? So what I'd like you to do is to close your eyes and only close your eyes if it's safe for you do to safe for you to do so don't close your eyes if it's not safe to close your eyes what i'd like to do is just to ensure that you're in a comfortable position just ensure you're sitting or lying comfortably And I'd like you just to bring your awareness to your environment. Just have a sense of what you'd see when your eyes are open. The colours, the shapes, the textures. Just have that sense of your environment. And now bring your attention to any sounds that you hear other than the sound of my voice. And you can allow any sounds that you don't need to pay attention to to just wash over you as you allow yourself to be guided by my voice. I'd like you just to bring your awareness to your physical body. Noticing the position of your arms and legs. Noticing the contact between your body and any surfaces touching your body.
And as you have that awareness of those physical sensations, maybe the temperature of the air on your skin, the sounds that you can hear, and the things you see when your eyes are open. I'd like you to consider that you have the ability to change your behaviours and choose behaviours and habits that support you. You have the ability to identify your wishes identify what you want, to get really clear on why you want that thing. Because when we get really clear on our why, we experience more clarity and motivation to take steps to move towards that goal. You have the ability to identify those obstacles, to learn from experiences in the past, so that you can make a plan, so that you can move forward towards your goals. When we adopt that problem solving mindset, we're adopting a growth mindset. And we know that when we adopt that mindset, it gives us a sense of agency. I'd like you just to allow your unconscious mind to learn whatever it needs to learn from this experience today so that you can just identify a first step and move forward. If you'd like help with any of this, just get in touch. But for now, I'll say thanks for watching and participating. And bye for now.